Welcome. This is a presentation about the Spatiotemporal Epidemiological Modeler, or STEM. STEM is an open source disease modeling application available through the Eclipse Foundation at the following URL, www.eclipse.org STEM. STEM is available under the Eclipse public license, so you're able to download it and use it for free. You're also welcome to contribute back to the project. These are some of the many contributors and users of STEM. One of the major contributors is the IBM Research Division. The project was actually started inside IBM Research. Other users include national public health organizations, and contributors may be found at universities all over the world, including Johns Hopkins, UPMC, Pitt, the University of Vermont, the University of Tel Aviv, Stanford, MIT, and many others. So what exactly is STEM? STEM is a framework and development tool for composing spatial and temporal models of infectious diseases. STEM uses the latest component software architecture based on a standard called the OSGI initiative. The Eclipse Equinox platform is the reference implementation of the standard. By using a component software architecture, STEM enables model composition. All of the components of STEM, including the code and the data, are reusable and available as plugins or bundles. STEM comes with a large number of plugins, including global data, such as geographic data, population data, demographics, information about transportation, such as roads and air travel, and basic models of diseases. Its architecture supports collaboration because users can not only create new models and compose new scenarios, but exchange these models and scenarios as reusable components and therefore build on each other's work. So what exactly does that mean? Let's look at a simple example. Imagine that a new strain of influenza has evolved and is beginning to spread worldwide. One might want to estimate, for example, how long after the first 10 cases of the new virus appears in New York City would we expect to see an outbreak peak in San Francisco? Also, what is the likely number of cases expected to occur over the duration of the outbreak? To answer these questions requires a predictive model. Modeling the spread of disease in a population is in many ways like modeling the weather. Unlike the weather, however, public health policy may change the outcome of an epidemic. For example, in this scenario, one could also ask how the total number of cases would change if we implement social distancing policies or add vaccination or close schools. What data would we need to develop a predictive model? The data required for a model of infectious disease is called denominator data. The type of denominator data you need depends on the type of disease you want to model. For our example, we certainly need to know the number of people that live in New York City and in San Francisco. We also will want to know the ways that people travel between New York City and San Francisco, including not only road transportation and trains, but also air travel. We also require a model of the disease itself. What are the characteristics of the disease? What is the transmission rate or basic replication rate of the virus? How long, on average, is a person going to be infectious? This is called the recovery rate. How long, on average, are people immune once they recover? This is the immunity loss rate. What is the mortality rate of the disease? What fraction of the population is normally expected to be resistant to or immune to this new virus? These are the basic disease parameters. These disease parameters are used as coefficients in a mathematical model for the disease itself. Users may create their own mathematical models or choose from several different mathematical models that are already available as plugins in STEM. Two of the models available are shown pictorially here. These built in models are called compartment models. A compartment model divides the population or populations being studied into several different disease states or compartments. In this example, we show an SIRS model wherein individuals may be in either a susceptible, infectious, or recovered state, and an SEIRS model, where individuals may also be placed in an exposed, but not yet infectious state. You can think of each compartment or state 
like a room in a house. A person may move between the different rooms, but they can only exist in one room at a time. The entire population will be distributed among the rooms or compartments defined by the model. The total population may increase or decrease depending upon the birth and death rates. The rate at which individuals move between the SIR or the SEIR states are defined by mathematical equations that are not unlike chemical rate equations. The disease parameters we discussed already are the constants of these rate equations. In an SI, SIR, or SEIR model, susceptible people leave the susceptible state by interacting with infectious people. This interaction defines the infection process. STEM comes with both deterministic and stochastic models and also a choice of integration engines. Why are so many different mathematical models required to study infectious disease? Different diseases behave differently. Certain RNA viruses, such as rhinovirus and coronaviruses, which make up the common cold, mutate so rapidly that individuals recently recovered from a cold will still be susceptible to other strains of the same virus circulating in the population. So to model the cold, one needs simply an SIS model. There's no recovered state. For infections that confer lifelong immunity in the recovered state, such as measles and mumps, an SIR model is appropriate. In this case, people never leave the recovered state as long as they live. For cases involving influenza viruses, an SIRS model is needed because immunity is not lifelong and decreases over time. Other infectious diseases are characterized by an incubation period between exposure to a pathogen and the development of clinical symptoms. If the exposed individual is not shedding viruses during this incubation period, it can be important to model the incubation time explicitly. For viruses like smallpox, it's important to model this exposed state as there is a delay of 7 to 14 days between the time at which an individual is infected and the time at which that individual becomes infectious. So modeling diseases requires many models. It also requires potentially a large amount of denominator data. A disease that affects humans requires data about humans, but many diseases also involve the animal population. This large requirement on both data and models is one of the motivations for creating STEM as an open source project. People from different disciplines with different expertise can each contribute data as independent plugins that can be composed to create new models. The good news is that STEM provides a large amount of denominator data today. It has a large built-in library containing population and geographic data for almost every country on the planet, data on road transportation networks for many countries, and even a global air transportation model, including over 1,700 of the world's largest airports. More good news, STEM also gives you tools you need to design your own models of infectious disease, including wizards for picking and creating your disease models from a number of common types of models, infectors and inoculators to model new infections, as well as vaccination, and a system of triggers, predicates, and modifiers that will allow you to model public health policies such as social distancing. Okay, let's see how to download, install, and run STEM. Okay, I'm gonna go to the uh, main download site for STEM. Uh, it's uh, www.eclipse.org slash stem slash downloads.php. And there you have it. Um, so there's a number of things on this website. Uh, you see the latest stable build that we try to update as often as we can. Right now I'm gonna go down to the uh, integration builds. This is the most recent build of STEM available. And uh, we do builds for Windows, uh, Linux, both 32 and 64 bit. Uh, as well as Mac OS. Let's pick the Windows build. And I'm going to download it from one of the mirrors. And just uh, save the zip file. Okay, we finished downloading. At this point, I'm just going to extract the zip file and a uh, you can extract it anywhere you want to. Just gonna put it on the folder called IBM. Uh, 
There you go. Let's just navigate to where I extracted, open the stem folder, and double click on uh, stem.exe file uh, on Windows. Uh, I should say that uh, a prerequisite uh, to run stem, you need a at least a Java 1.5 compatible runtime environment installed. It's a nice launching. So this is the first screen and you will see um, when STEM comes up at the top, you, uh, we have the three perspectives. Uh, right now we're in a simulation perspective. Uh, this is the perspective you'd be using to look at your simulation and look at the results and see it running. Uh, the designer perspective is where you design your models. And finally, the analysis perspective is where you can look at the outcome of uh, simulations and uh, look at the data and analyze it. Uh, so, uh, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to navigate down into the built in scenarios we have in STEM. So, I'm going to go down into countries. So, we have a, a built in scenario for pretty much any country in the world. Um, I'm just going to pick one here. I'm going to pick China. And uh, I'm going to run this particular one, which is the most detailed map we have of China, starting with 10,000 infections at a particular location. And I'm going to just right click and say run. So nice running. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen we have the simulation control. This is where you can, uh, for instance, pause the simulation. So now it's paused. I can resume or I can rewind or I can step the simulation one, one step at a time. In this case, it's one day at a time. And the time that you're looking at here is the uh, simulated time. So right now we're looking at, you know, January 11, 2000. Uh, this is something that's part of the model where you can specify the sequencer that will define the flow time in, 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 in your model. So now I'm going to restart the simulation. I'm going to show you another feature. So now we're running again uh, from the beginning. So this is the map. Bring it up. So we're looking at uh, map of China. The polygons in this case are uh, regions or cities in China. This is the built-in map view that comes with STEM. It is also possible to direct the output of STEM to other viewers, for instance, Google Earth. Let's uh, wait a little bit here for the disease to start taking off. So as you can see, the disease has started spreading from central China. Uh, the color red means that we're looking at the relative number of infectious individuals at the particular uh, region. You can change that uh, down here. So right now, I means we want to display uh, infections. Uh, we can also uh, look at, for instance, the susceptible population, which uh, shows up as blue, as you can tell by the color legend. So right now, pretty much all of China is susceptible, uh, except right here where people have become infected and are starting to recover. So uh, you can also go and look at the recovered population. Uh, so that's one way to visualize the state of a disease. We also have another option, something called uh, rainbow relative values. And this is simply showing, using a different color scheme, as you can tell by the color legend, the relative value of, uh, in this case, infectious individuals. You go her susceptible individuals. 
Anyway, let's switch back. We can also change the the gain factor of the colors. We're increasing the intensity of the colors to make them show up better on the map. We can also have the option of uh, using either linear or logarithmic scaling uh, when we're mapping the relative values of the disease to, to colors. So now I'm using a linear scaling. As you can see, the uh, disease is spreading uh, as a wave across the country and this is due to the fact that in this particular model we only model uh, transportation via uh, common borders between cities. Uh, we do not have air uh, transportation uh, as part of this model. We also have the option on the map if we don't want to draw the polygon borders we can disable that and only show the colors for the disease spreading the out. So let's just wait and uh, watch the disease propagate across China. So going back, uh, let me show you another feature. I'm going to restart the simulation. And what you see down here, let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, we're looking at the time series plot. And on this plot, you can pick any region. I just go up to the map and just click on a random region. Uh, right there. There you go. So on the time series plot, uh, you can watch the curves for um, the susceptible, infected, exposed and recovered population in this case. And you have different colors for every curve for this region. So let's wait for the disease to take off and you should see the plot here start changing. So now you can see how the yellow and the red curve are starting to go up. So we're getting more and more infections and people being exposed to the disease. Let's make it a little bit bigger. And now for this particular region, the disease has pretty much peaked and uh, you see it starts seeing a drop in infections. And you can show, you know, any number of these plots uh, side by side uh, for any number of regions that you want to look at. All right, let's stop. Okay, now we're going to switch over to a different perspective. Uh, let's go to the designer perspective. Uh, there you have it. So this is uh, where you would define your model for the particular disease you would like to study. In this case, I'm just going to start with importing an existing project that I designed earlier. You have it. It's a fairly simple uh, project. It's just one uh, location, Cuba. The reason I want to show you this is to demonstrate another feature. So this model 
I'm going to open something called a scenario here. The scenario contains a number of things. It contains a model. Uh, a model is essentially a container of this case of, uh, of the geography of Cuba and uh, the population of Cuba. And it also contains the model for the, our disease. In this case, uh, I've set up a seasonal flu model. So this is a model that essentially drives up the transmission rate of a disease during uh, during the influenza seasons. So that's the model. We also have a sequencer. This is a sequencer that starts in June uh, 12 uh, and it goes on for, forever essentially and it updates the state of the simulation every day. And finally we have an infector. Uh, an infector is something that at the beginning of the simulation infects uh, one or many people at the particular uh, location that you can specify. Uh, okay, so let's just run this. I'm gonna go say run. So I wanted to show you, let's see, this is the time series plot that you saw earlier. Uh, I'm looking now at Cuba and we'll wait and you should see, we put on the logarithmic scale in this case. You can choose between a linear scale and a log scale for the charts, the graph. So, right now you see we're looking at essentially the, the dynamics of the disease during uh, off-seasons. Uh, for instance, for flu uh, in the summertime, uh, you don't see a lot of flu activity. But we should see it start taking off during the influenza season. So now you can see the infection starting to go up. And at this point, um, you can tell the influenza season has peaked and we're starting to see drops in in uh, flu cases. So now we're into the second wave of the influenza, the second season starting to peak. The other thing I wanted to show you is the another feature, the phase space plot. Let's open that up. And let's uh, use a logarithmic scale on this one too. There you go. So on this um, chart you can configure what you want the y and the x axis to represent. In uh, this particular case the y axis is the relative number of infectious individuals and the x axis is the relative number of susceptible individuals. Um, so, and you can see how it uh, essentially, the dy dynamics of the disease, it's oscillating, where the infectious cases uh, goes up and then they start dropping. Right now they're peaking, you can see, during the influenza season. And the number of uh, susceptible individuals is dropping fast. So that's the phase space plot. And you can, just as a time series, you can pick any any region that you would like to look at uh, in a phase space. Okay, we're back in the <coughs> designer perspective. Let me get rid of the Cuba product. We are done with this for now. Okay, so coming back to the, the problem we, we described uh, in the beginning, where we We'd like to try to see if we can estimate how soon after, let's say, 10 cases of a pandemic flu is detected in New York can we expect a peak in, in, in flu cases in San Francisco. 
So let's try to answer that question. Uh, so the first thing we would want to do is uh, I want to create a new project. So I go to the new project wizard. I'm just going to call this one uh, USA. Yeah. All right, so I have a new project. There's nothing in it right now. Okay, um, so now what I want to do, I want to create uh, something called a model. So I go to the Okay, so this is a new model wizard. I'm just going to call it uh, USA model and uh, finish. So a model is something that will contain uh, essentially two things. So it will contain data about the region that I want to study. So geographic information, population information, etc. Also air transportation, road transportation models. Uh, and it also contains the model for the disease itself. So, so now we have a model. I want to go down and I want to go down and look at the STEM library. So to do that, we have two views. We have something called a model view and a graph view. Think of the model view as, as a higher level, uh, at a higher level than graphs. So models are kind of like pre-built models that we uh, defined in STEM for your convenience. So you can easily uh, drag into your uh, into your own model. Graphs are lower level components that you gives you a little bit more flexibility in combining building exactly what you want. Uh, but for now, we um, just going to go down into the model and open up. Go down to United States. There you go, United States. And into my model, I will see so a lot of things in here. Uh, these are the pre-built model that I described. Uh, I will use something called uh, uh, the USA human population level 0, 1, and 2. This is data for uh, United States and states within the US and uh, counties, as well as population data for the counties. Uh, I think that's it. So let me drag that into my model. You have it. Okay, there you go. Next thing I want to uh, include in my model is a model for the transportation and we don't have any pre-built models uh, right now containing uh, transportation data, so I'm going to get that from the graphs. Go down, and get down to the United States again. Okay, so we want the air transportation between counties and states. That one we want. And uh, we want air transportation between the states and the USA. So to connect states together, there you have it. Okay, uh, let's see. I also want to have the road transportation network uh, for the United States for level two. So I'm going to drag that into my model. Okay, so let's, let's close things up. So let's go ahead and define uh, the disease model for the disease itself. So I'm just going to use the define a new disease uh, button up here. Uh, okay. So in this case, we want to look at pandemic type influenza. Let's just give it a name, flu. Yeah. Now we get to pick uh, our disease model from a number of built-in disease models in STEM. So uh, I'm not going to go into details on all of this, but the one we want to use in this case, I'm going to pick the deterministic SEIR disease model. Uh, so this is an SEIR model that we uh, described uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, I get to pick which solver algorithm I want to use. And the solver is something that is used um, to solve the, this differential equation that is described um, by the uh, disease model. And there is two options here. You can use something called a finite difference, which is a simplified solver. It calculates essentially one solution every time step. Uh, it's good for demos. It runs fast. Uh, it's not very accurate. You also have the Runge-Kutta adaptive step size. Uh, this is 
a solver that is able to adjust the step size uh, attempting to keep uh, the error below a certain tolerance uh, you can actually specify exactly what tolerance you want in the uh, relative tolerance right there uh, so the smaller you set this number the more accurate the results you're going to get but also the slower the uh, simulation will run so but for now i'm just gonna use the finite difference okay moving on i'm gonna so specify the name again. Um, uh, now we need to fill in uh, additional attributes for our disease. Uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, so for instance, uh, the background mortality rate is the death rate in the population in general. And the uh, same for the birth rate. I'm just going to leave this r relative tolerance I described. See transmission rate. Uh, this determines how easily the disease transmits from one person to the next. Going to use uh, 1.2. Um, infectious recovery rate. So how long are you going to be sick for? Let's say you're sick for about five days, so 0 0.2. And infectious mortality rate, you know, how much more likely are you to die if you're infected? Let's just say that it's zero for now. And uh, yeah, that's not good. Uh, immunity loss rate, how long are you immune for? Say you're immune for about three years. So let's see, incubation rate, so this determines how long the incubation period is for the disease. Let's say it's about uh, three days, uh, 0 0.3. Okay, we're done. Let's finish. Okay, we have our disease. The disease itself ends up under something called decorators. Uh, this is the name we use in STEM for, for diseases and also infectors. Uh, anyway, so let's um, open my model and I will drag my new disease into the model. Okay, next. Uh, we need to define something called the scenario. Let's call it USA scenario. The scenario will contain, uh, first of all, the model I want to simulate. It will contain something called a sequencer, which defines the flow of time in my simulation. You know, uh, for when do you want to start? When do you want to stop? And how frequently do you want to calculate a solution, uh, like daily or every six hours or every week? Or uh, so let's uh, start with the dra by dragging my model into my scenario. Here have it. Good. Uh, next, um, let's define my sequencer. Say sequencer. Uh, cycle period is one day. Let's you know calculate the solution every day, starting today, June 12, and uh, let's have it run for. Let's see. Let's have it run for about eight months, maybe. There you go. Okay. okay so. Let's uh, take the sequencer and drag it into my model. Oh, into my scenario, sorry. And the final thing we need is to create an infector. And uh, in this particular problem, we wanted to know after 10 cases are detected in New York City, how long does it take for the disease to peak in San Francisco? So let's create an infector that infects 10 people in New York. Call this uh, flu infector. Uh, it's an infector. Uh, the name of the disease is a flu. You want to infect the human population with 10 cases and then you need to specify the region. So the United States. Uh, level one is essentially the states. So New, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, New York. 
and uh, New York, New York. Okay. everything. Okay, so now we have an effector which shows up on the decorators. Um, let's um, drag the infector into my scenario. We're done. Save. Okay, we have everything we need. Uh, so um, now we're just gonna go ahead and. Uh, oh, actually, first, before I start running the simulation, I want to turn on logging so we can log the results of uh, of our run here. Okay, I'm gonna go to the CSV logger view. Let's turn on logger. There you go. Now it's on. Okay. And now we're ready to run. So let's start. Uh, there we have it. So we're running. In this case, I'm plotting the the time series plot. I'm plotting San Francisco and New York, as you can tell. Let's zoom in a little bit on the map. So now we're running along. One thing I forgot to show you earlier is uh, you can uh, use uh, this edges drop down on the map view to show you things like um, um, road networks or air transportation networks. Uh, so let's just look at the roads right now for the US. See how they show up. There you have, that's the US interstate road network. Uh, all right, let's turn it off. Let's make the map a little bit bigger. So now you can see um, in the time series plot how for New York the number of infections uh, starts going up. And at this point the outbreak has essentially peaked in New York. Uh, we don't see any uh, infectious yet in uh, San Francisco. So now you can see how the uh, flu has uh, started spreading uh, across the United States. Uh, it has uh, the number of cases have peaked in New York at this point and uh, let's wait a little bit longer and wait for the number of cases in uh, San Francisco to also peak. And there you have it. Now it's now it's you can see that the peak has passed uh, San Francisco. So at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and pause the simulation. There you go, and there you have the answer to the question uh, we wanted. The answer is that after about let's make this bigger. Uh, after about let's see, about 72 days after the first 10 cases have been uh, detected in New York, do we see a peak of influenza cases in? Uh, San Francisco for this particular model. Now if I go back to 
uh, remember how we enabled uh, logging before we started uh, this uh, simulation so let's go back to the designer perspective and I'll show you where the log files end up and what they look like uh, they end up under a folder called uh, recorded simulations as a subfolder which has a generated name with today's date in it and a, and a number as a folder for uh, the particular disease that we're logging data for and there is a, a number of uh, comma separated value files, CSV files in this uh, and uh, the names depends on the, uh, the particular compartment state of the disease we've been using so this was an SEIR model so we have an an S files so we have basically three S files for every geographic uh, level in our uh, uh, in our in our model so we have a uh, uh, so for instance s2 dot CSV contains let me show what it looks like I'm going to use a I'm going to use the text pad in this case All right, word pad. We use the word pad, so let's see what it looks like. It's a pretty big file. So, you go. so the first line contains a description of the columns. So the, the first column is the iteration number. The second is the stem time, and then there is one column for every location in the simulation. Uh, so these are all the counties and the IDs we internal IDs we use for the counties. And then uh, we're looking at the susceptible population. So the numbers are the total number of susceptible individuals uh, for those particular regions. And we have the same for the recovered, uh, the infections, and the exposed. You also have birth, deaths, disease deaths, and incidence files. Okay. Next thing I want to show you is uh, how to set up a trigger um, that will get invoked when a condition is true and uh, will execute uh, some action like modifying some part of the of the scenario so okay so let's start by uh, defining a new trigger so, let's call it my trigger let's call it trigger one finish Okay, there's our trigger. It's pretty empty right now. Uh, let's define a predicate. Uh, predicate one. Finish. Here's the predicate. Okay, now I need to specify exactly what we mean by this predicate. Uh, the, tri the trigger will basically get invoked when uh, this predicate is true. So. You do this. You, do, you right click and say uh, create a new child. Um, and in this case, I'm gonna uh, the predicate is gonna be true when a certain time have elapsed uh, in in the simulation. So after zero days, I say here I go down and I look at the properties view, and I see number of days. I want to set this to uh, the actual number of days I want to use. So let's say after 40 days of simulated time, uh, this predicate is true. Okay, we have the predicate, we have the trigger. Let's um, let's drag the predicate into my trigger. There you go. So there you have it. Okay, so that's defined. Now, what do we want to do when uh, you know, after forty days? Um, so we need to create something called the modifier that will modify some particular aspect of this scenario. In this case, I want to look at the disease model in itself, and I want to modify the disease model to uh, essentially simulate a social distancing policy being invoked after 40 days that will have an effect of reducing the transmission rate of the disease. So look at my flu disease model open up the root and I yep. there's my disease model you want to right click and you want to say create a modifier okay. 
Do you have it? Modifier one. So this is listing all the different uh, parameters of, of, of our disease. Uh, I want to change the transmission rate. So I want to set it to say I want to cut it by 50%. So let's set it to 0 0.6. Uh, right now this is a little bit clunky, you have to fill in two of these values because the modifiers are used uh, in other parts of the product. That one you'll set to zero. And we're done. Okay, and uh, let's uh, look at the trigger again. Uh, here's my modifier. And let's drag the modifier into the trigger. And finally, let's make the trigger part of our scenario. So I'm going to drag the trigger into my scenario. And save. Okay, now we're ready to run the scenario um, with the new trigger we just defined. Uh, before we do that, I'm gonna first I want to turn on, make sure I turn on logging before I start this. So let's go to the logging perspective. Oh, the logging view. And turn it on. Okay. Next thing I'm gonna want to run this. I want to run this particular simulation uh, as fast as possible, so I'm going to ch change a few things in my preferences here. We go to Window Preferences, open up STEM. Uh, first of all, uh, disease modeling, you specify how many threads you want to work uh, concurrently when you're running a simulation. And you want to set it to the number of uh, CPUs you have available, the number of cores on your machine. In this case, two is a good number because this particular machine I'm running on has uh, two CPUs. Um, simulation management, by default there is a there is a short pause between every cycle of the simulation making sure that the map has time to update itself and uh, time series view etc. In this case I want to disable this, I'm just going to uncheck it. And I want to close as much as possible over here, I don't want to see the map, I don't want to see Time series or phase space doesn't interest me right now. Okay, we're done. So let's now we're ready to run. So let's start the scenario. Logging is turned on, so we will log all the results. Yeah, now it's running. Okay, uh, now we're done um, with this simulation. Uh, let's look at the results. So let's go to the analysis perspective and I'll show you some of the features. So now we're looking at the epidemic view in the analysis perspective. Uh, you would use uh, this view basically to um, plot the aggregate results of a simulation. Uh, so uh, first we need to pick the folder containing our uh, log files. So that's the one we just uh, ran. Okay, so now we want to aggregate the data. So now it's aggregating. This is uh, essentially at every time step aggregating the S, E, I, and R uh, values for every location that is part of our model. Okay, we're done. So now we have two aggregate files uh, generated and we can plot them. And then we have it. So on the left side, uh, similar to this time series plot, but this is now we're looking at an aggregate of all locations. Uh, so, and you can uh, filter what you want to see here. Uh, and on the right side, uh, we see uh, the incidence. The next thing I want to show is how to compare two scenarios. So there is a view called the scenario comparison. Let's go there. So what we have now, we have basically logged uh, the results for two runs, uh, one without a social distancing policy and one with a social distancing policy that is triggered uh, after 40 days. So now we want to see what effect the, uh, uh, the policy has. So I'm gonna... This is the folder containing the log files for uh, our first scenario. Uh, 
this is the second one. I should change that. Okay, uh, let's analyze. Uh, and now we're done. Uh, a little bit hard to see, but you can see plot here for every time step, uh, plotting the root mean square difference between the two time series for the infectious, I should say, for the infectious counts uh, for both scenarios. At the bottom, we see the average uh, root mean square difference about 0.82. So in this particular case, the social distance policy uh, reduced the number of infections by about 18%. Uh, And there you have it. Uh, that concludes uh, this demonstration of the spatial temporal epidemiological modeler. I encourage you to go online to www.eclipse.org/stem to learn more about the product. Thank you for your attention.